And uh, hello, 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 everyone, my good friends. Glad you can join us here for hour number two of the show today. I am your host, Randall White, and as always, we are coming to you live from California's beautiful Central Coast. This is where California comes to talk about the very latest food, beverage, and travel trends, news and information that affects your physical and possibly more importantly, mental health, and (laughs) how you spend your leisure time here in the Golden State. Straight ahead on this hour of the Edric Explore radio program, my lovely co-host Patty Pyburn and I uh, will talk travel tips. Uh, This week, we focus on how to write off as much as you possibly can when combining business and pleasure on trips out of town. Sounds great. Here's one little thing, little tidbit I uh, picked up. You know, if you schedule your meetings like Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, okay, uh, then sort of by nature you have to be there through the weekend, and then that's all a write-off. Oh, that's pretty tricky. Uh huh. That pretty smart. And, <laughs> that is pretty smart, isn't it? That and many other things we'll be discussing um, when we. Bring in an expert in the field who is also the author of a book, 1001 Tax Breaks and Deductions, the 2014 version. So uh, right on track with all the, you know, Mm -hmm. because the laws constantly change. Yes, it's hard to keep up with sometimes. It's irritating. Also (laughs) ahead on today's program, there have been so many headlines and fret over a possible global wine shortage. All of us in the room take a gasp. (gasps) No, it (laughs) can't be so. It isn't true. (laughs) Uh, In the years to come. But how realistic is this scenario? A report released last month by Morgan Stanley Research says the outlook is dire. But our guest today says, (laughs) hold on. It's not that bad. Rob McMillan, we've had him on the show once before. He really knows the wine business and is the go-to source for many in the industry. We'll get his take on the situation at the bottom of the hour. And then we round out our Sunday Fun Day show today with cooking lessons throughout the state, including, all right, Patty, I know you'd want to do every single one of these, bread baking in San Francisco. Okay. With Sounds. a company called Sour Flour. I love wow, that. Oh, uh-huh. I love that too. Uh, and then Blue Ribbon Pie Baking in Los Angeles, a cocktail mixing class. <laughs> wow. <laughs> which will be a lot of fun. And then a trip to a Napa Valley farmer's market followed up with culinary lessons by a top chef in a top kitchen amazing it's actually like this estate (laughs) there in napa you go and use that kitchen oh darn after picking up all your fresh produce yeah (laughs) so that sounds awesome doesn't it yes it does but right now it is time to get the very latest news headlines from our lovely patty pyburn who uh, puts on her news cap for the moment (laughs) indeed That's right. I have the latest from the Eat, Drink, Explore News Desk. On this Sunday morning, FAA and NTSB investigators are looking into what caused a hot air balloon to explode yesterday in Temecula wine country. Four people were injured with three of those in serious condition, according to the Riverside County Fire Department. One occupant of the balloon's gondola gondola is at a nearby burn center, while two others are hospitalized at a local trauma center. The balloon safely landed Saturday morning just before the explosion on board. It was on the ground on a dirt road, I hear. And then exploded. And then exploded. So it was something, it wasn't like the balloon exploded. It It was was, something with the equipment that that keeps it up in the air. Wow, that is really scary. Mm -hmm. Well, the wife of world-famous chef Charlie Trotter says she wants to clear up some misinformation surrounding her husband's death this past week. In a letter to news outlets, Rochelle Trotter says her husband was cleared to travel by doctors following a seizure back in January. Now, a police report had noted family members who said the chef was not supposed to fly nor stay at high altitudes. Trotter returned Monday night from a culinary event in Wyoming and was found dead at his Chicago home Tuesday morning by his son. At this point, no official cause of death has been released. A memorial is scheduled for tomorrow. He was really self-taught, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, his restaurant in uh, Chicago closed. He chose to close it, you know, even though business was fine, Mm -hmm. at least the reports I've read. Uh, He wanted to take time to just explore with his wife. He was at one of these points in his life where he wanted to enjoy everything he built. Right, right. Uh, which is really sad. Uh, that but is very sad. He had uh, great influence over chefs here in California and beyond. Uh, yeah, Charlie Trotter, uh, his big memorial tomorrow, open to the public. I, 
I wish I lived in Chicago so I could so go there. So you could attend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's a sad story. Hey, city leaders in Monterey are now working with representatives of the Amgen Tour of California after some initial confusion <laughs> regarding next year's host city announcements. This is kind of funny. Yeah. Monterey was caught off guard apparently this week over being chosen as the stage four starting point because race organizers have been working instead with the county's convention and visitors bureau. Surprise, you're it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it's all going to turn out just fine. Yeah. Cities all over California register to be chosen as a host location as the cycling race brings in international attention and lots of tourist dollars. Yeah. Well, Monterey hosted this event back in 2006, the first year for that race. And according to the Monterey Herald, city and race representatives are now working out the details regarding how the expenses are to be covered. Yeah. Cities have to pony up some cash for this event. In some cases, they won't. Uh, the Amgen people won't say what they have involved with each city. What the deal is, yes. According to the Herald, Monterey did have to pay, I think it was like $16,000 or Mm -hmm. something back in 2006. That was the first year of the race. And remember, it used to be held in February. Right. It's yeah. changed because of the, the well, rain. I don't know that that's going to be a concern this year. We hope yeah, it will be a concern. Yeah, we hope it'll be a concern, the rain. But yeah, so uh, apparently Monterey's turned down an opportunity to do it in the subsequent years. It's really years. expensive. It's a lot more than 16000 now yeah. for cities. So uh, the race has been so successful, though, I, I think that the race p- covers most of the costs. So but we'll find out. But yes. <laughs> I think it is sort of funny. And it's going to come down our direction, I think, to Pismo this year, right? That's instead right. Of, instead yeah. of Avila. Uh-huh. It was Avila last year. Pismo Beach and Santa Barbara will host yes. stage five. Yeah. And Santa Barbara was one of the spots last year as well. They did it really well. I have to say, hats off to Santa Barbara. They really were on their game. Yeah. I was down there and they were all over it. And Cambria is the end of stage four. Very nice. Beautiful spot. They're so spot. excited. Uh-huh. <laughs> I bet they are. <laughs> hey, well, stage four uh, starts in Monterey, continues. Continues down Highway 1, as you were just saying, through Big Sur, stopping in Cambria. Um, Central Coast Cities, Pismo Beach, Santa Barbara, hosting Stage 5, as Randall just said. So we're going to see it coming through our area. Mm -hmm. Lots of fun. Okay, an expansion of the California Coastal National Monument could soon include a stretch of land in Mendocino County. Interior Secretary Sally Jewell hiked a portion of the area on Friday near Point Arania. She later attended a public hearing where hundreds of residents showed up, mostly showing support for expanding the protected area, according to the Ukiah Daily Journal. Now, this is the final step before the Obama administration could add the 1,600-acre tract of land to the monument. If it's approved, it would be the first land-based addition to the monument. Currently, the California Coastal National Monument includes 20,000 small offshore islands, rocks, and reefs along the state's coastline, from Mexico to the Oregon border. Yeah, but this time it'll include that Point Arena area. Yeah. If if it happens, it looks mm-hmm. good. Looks pretty good. So very nice. Mm-hmm. All right, Randall, you were talking about this. We could be in the driest year yeah. on record for California history. Less than four inches of rain falling so far in San Francisco since January 1st. Yeah, driest spell since record keeping began 164 years ago, according to the National Weather Service and the San Francisco Chronicle. So yikes. We all need to like start doing the rain dance. Or yes, something. exactly. Hey, it's vanilla cake cupcake day (laughs) so enjoy that we're back in just a moment talking uh travel write-offs This fall, Eat Drink Explore Media is teaming up with the nation's leading gift company focused on experiences from skydiving to wine tasting, culinary tours to whale watching. You name the activity and it's likely you'll find it on the Experience Days website. And here's the best part. Because you're a listener to our show, you'll get 15% off anything you buy on the site during the upcoming holiday gift buying season. It's really simple. Just use our three-letter promo code E. E-D-E, which of course stands for Eat, Drink, Explore. Find Experience Days online at the letter Experience Days, all one word, dot com. Or head to our website, eatdrinkexplore.com, and click on the menu tab for holiday gift ideas, and you'll be on your way to finding an abundance of unique gifts and saving a lot of money to boot. Remember the three-letter promo code E-D-E for 15% savings on some of the best adventures California has to offer. In most parts of the country, autumn means falling leaves and cool or even cold days. But in Palm Springs, it's the kickoff for the area's fun season with warm, sunny days and exciting, vibrant nights. Right at the center of everything is the newly renovated All Sweet 
Hyatt Palm Springs, a classic resort property that sits at the base of the San Jacinto Mountains. The resort features in-room spa services, a poolside bar, cabanas, and the Share Small Plate Bistro and Wine Lounge. Also, just steps away, world-class shopping, some of the state's best dining options, and for a limited time, the famous Forever Maryland statue. Make your next destination Palm Springs, and while you're there, make your home the all Sweet Hyatt. Get the best rates online at HyattPalmSprings.com. That's Hyatt, H-Y-A-T-T, PalmSprings.com. You've waited all week, and it's finally here. The Eat, Drink, Explore Weekly Travel Deals Extravaganza. Extravaganza is the keyword. Good morning, everyone. Great to have you with us. 19 minutes now past the hour here on this Sunday. Fun day. Patty Pyburn joining me. I'm Randall White. A ghost of my former self, if you're watching us, right? (laughs) Yes. And you know, the funny thing is, is right when you said that, Patty, you like filled in solidly. Did I start to clear up? Yeah. So that's good. Very nice. Our video simulcast that we do online at eatdrinkexplore.com, we have a virtual studio. And so (laughs) Patty has a green screen behind her. And for some reason today, she was sort of like... (laughs) I was very ghostly. (laughs) All right. Uh, Or glowing, however you'd like to describe it. (laughs) You look fantastic now. So as you know, Patty, I do a lot of travel for my work. Yes. Yes, you do. And because we talk about eating, drinking, and exploring, a lot of times when I'm traveling, I feel like I'm there for pleasure, you know, (laughs) but in reality, I'm working. And when it comes tax time, then I don't know, like, well, what can I write off? Uh, (laughs) What was too much fun to be considered business? (laughs) (laughs) Right? I feel feel like my tax return is just like a pile of red flags. And so uh, we... There are a lot of people out there that travel for business, Mm -hmm. but will combine, especially if you're going to like a Las Vegas or any of those places. Try to take advantage of something fun while they're there doing the the work. And how much of that can you write off? Well, author Barbara Weltman joins us. She is a tax attorney and a business expert. You can find her online at BarbaraWeltman.com. She joins us with some of these answers. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning to you. Terrific to have you with us. I should say good afternoon because you're in Florida and it's already past the noon hour. It's noon. That's all right. <laughs> uh, Barbara, Florida is one of those places people go, Miami or Orlando for a convention. And then how do you go to Orlando for a convention and not visit, you know, take your family or whoever you're with to like one of the Disney parks or what have you? Yes, so. I did that exact thing when my kids were young. Did you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> 
I didn't write well, it off, it's, though, it's, so I want to hear about this. Yes. It's no coincidence that many of the conventions are scheduled in Las Vegas, New Orleans, Orlando, because there's the opportunity for people to unwind and relax and have some fun. As long as the primary purpose for the trip is business, I mean, and there's no bright line here. There's no number of days or, or anything that you really have to spend uh-huh. on business. But as long as you could say, you know, I wouldn't have taken the trip but for the business, as long as the primary purpose, then you could deduct all of your airfare there. Oh, that's now, good. when it comes to your lodging, then you have to make allocations if, let's say, you spend three days on business and two days for fun. Then those two days, you can't deduct the additional uh, lodging and, and meals and such that you would spend just for yourself, for sightseeing, visiting family, or, or other personal pursuits. Barbara, what if you have a meeting on a Thursday or Friday, and then the, those meetings will continue on Monday and Tuesday, so you're sort of forced to stay there over the weekend. Could you then subtract or, you know, write off the, the lodging, middle portion. that middle portion, even though you're there and because it's a weekend, you're, you know, doing pleasure things? Well, when it comes to taxes, things aren't always black and white, but the answer would be probably. Mm-hmm. However, anything that you would spend on your personal uh, pursuits, like you're, you're playing a round of golf on the weekend, you can't write that off. <laughs> That's on you. <laughs> That's on you. Okay. What if there's a key, a key client or something that you really want to spend quality time with uh, in order to loop them in and they happen to be part of your golf foursome? Well, then you can, there are meal and entertainment allowances and you can deduct 50% of the cost of doing that. Again, you got to make sure that you're real, that, that, this is really business. I yeah. mean, you, you don't want to fool around and, and kind of pad your your tax returns. So yeah. In the long run, yeah, it probably isn't really, worth if it, it's right? it's legitimate, it's legitimate. But the key to all of this, from, from every question that you've asked, is that you really need excellent records. So, for example, if you t- did that round of golf with a client, keep notes about when you did it, where it was, who you talked to, and what you talked about. That's really um, smart advice, even though it sounds like once you say it, of course you would take notes. But I end up with receipts sometimes that I think, wait. What was I doing? What was this for? (laughs) Why did I keep this? Well, the good thing is there's an app for that. You can find an app to help you with all of your record keeping. You can find apps that that help you, you just scan your receipts or take a photo of your receipts. So they're automatically kept on your smartphone or, or, or other mobile device. That's what I need. You can put in all the information I just mentioned, and they they, they prompt you so it's easy to populate uh, all of the different uh, pieces of information that would help you support a deduction. Barbara, what is that called? Do you know? Well, that... there are so many out there. It's oh, okay. Oh, okay. There, there's tons of apps for for. Uh, for business uh, travel and entertainment costs. I absolutely have to download one of those because uh, my record keeping is horrific. (laughs) (laughs) You can't be the only one. Mine is as well. And that really is so important. This is sort of so easy now. I mean, it's not like you have to walk around now with a little notepad as we used to do. Now you can just keep everything on your smartphone. Plus, my wallet gets the size of a piece of Samsonite (laughs) luggage with all those uh, receipts in them. And so uh, I love the idea of taking a picture of the receipt. And then the receipt's gone. Yeah. That's, exactly. I don't want that That's receipt. That's so any smart. What's the number one mistake, Barbara, that you believe people make when they're trying to write things off for business travel? Well, it, it comes back to this record keeping. They first of all, everybody thinks they're going to remember. <laughs> and the bottom line is you don't remember. But even more important than that, the tax law specifically requires you to do certain record keeping for travel and entertainment costs. Why? Because the government's not stupid, and they know that this is an area where there's a potential for abuse because the line between personal and business is often gray. And so you have to have those records. And it's a pain. It's uh, But once you get into the habit of doing it, it becomes e- easy to do. And, and as I said, with technology today, it's even easier than ever before. One of the reasons why I did not keep records is because I was under the impression there 
and I maybe I'm still kind of right on this, but that there is uh, a set amount of like if the I don't wa- if, well if I don't want to itemize if I just want to mm-hmm. take the what do you call that? Like a standard. The standard deduction. The standard deduction for travel. Uh, because I can. There is no standard deduction for travel. Oh. What there <laughs> is. is <laughs> there is no standard deduction for travel. There are certain per diem rates that you can rely on in certain circumstances. But, for example, um, self employed people cannot use them for lodging, and you have to keep track Ooh. of all your lodging. And so there, there, are, there are specific rules, and there are different per diem rates. There's the federal per diem rate, the IRS has what's called a high low substantiation rate. And so the bottom line is probably you're you're going to come out better, meaning that you're going to get to write off more if you keep track of your actual costs. Wow, I need so, to change everything. <laughs> change your habits. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the um ramifications, Barbara? Let's just say Reynolds been this terrible record keeper and he's just kind of estimating, I think it's this much. And then the IRS says, you know what? We want to take a closer look. What is the ramification yeah. you're facing if you are a poor record keeper? Well, well, the problem is it's going to involve you in a lengthy audit rather than if they question something and you say, oh, well, I can show you my information. And then that, that usually satisfies the government and that's the end of it. But if you don't have those records and, and specifically written records or, or rec- electronic records that you could re- reduce to uh, a, a written uh, document, you're going to have trouble and you're going to probably have to call in a tax professional and that's going to cost you money. And it could be a lengthy, drawn out process till you get things resolved. There are ways to resolve it. There are um, things that you can say and do to uh, support your position, and it may very well help you. But again, it's it's much easier to um, have those records up front. Just do it right. <laughs> record keeping, do record right. keeping, record keeping. I'm on it, Barbara, I promise <laughs> you. Barbara Weltman, tax attorney and business expert. Barbara Weltman, that's W-E-L-T-M-A-N dot com. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Maybe we'll have you back uh, sometime around April. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Stick around, everyone. After this, it is a uh, expert of a different sort, a wine industry expert. Nice. Global wine shortage coming? Mm, Yikes. Find out. Randall White here at Sidecar Restaurant in downtown San Luis Obispo, where the month of November takes on a whole new theme. General Manager, owner Josh Christensen, why are the next few weeks so important? Well, Randall, we're really excited to be participating in Movember. I'm sure some people are familiar with the idea of the No Shave November, growing out your mustache to raise awareness for men's health issues. We here at Sidecar are going to do that with a little twist as well. And the twist is a mohawk? That is correct. We figured we'd go Mo Movember. So mustaches, mohawks for the guys. Even some of our Mo sisters here at the restaurant are going to be rocking a mohawk for the month of November. And it's all to raise awareness for men's health issues and try to raise some money for cancer research. Sidecar Restaurant, downtown San Luis Obispo, online, sidecarslo.com. Josh Christensen, general manager, owner at Sidecar Restaurant. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Randall. We'll see you at the restaurant. The traditional light bulb, a groundbreaking invention in 1879. Other groundbreaking ideas from that time, the whalebone corset, the pedal-operated submarine, and the two-story outhouse. We've come a long way since then. It's time our light bulbs did the same. Visit energysavers.gov and learn about energy-saving light bulbs. See, these new bulbs are more efficient than the old ones, like a text message is more efficient than a carrier pigeon. They last longer, too, like how we humans last longer now that doctors use antibiotics instead of leeches. And they cut down on our energy costs, because in our own groundbreaking age of aeroplanes and moving pictures, we deserve a light bulb that saves us some cash. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council.
Welcome back to the Eat, Drink, Explore radio network. Here now is your fabulous host, Mr. Randall White. Indeed. Hello, everyone. 9.33, now the time. Great to have you with us. I hope you're keeping record because now we all have to keep record after that interesting... You heard it here. ...travel tips <laughs> from the... Uh, tax expert from Florida, Barbara <clears throat> Barbara Weltman. She, yeah, I now I feel terrible. Like I haven't kept any receipts from any <laughs> trips. It's a good thing we had her on the show, Randall, because she got you straightened out. Exactly. Now to straighten us out is Rob McMillan. He is a wine. Oh, hold on. Oh, it's me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Pat. <laughs> that was um, me. <laughs> right. We uh, so Patty's the computer Patty uses uh, puts pipes all the sound in through the system, and if she opens up a website that automatically plays Starts a video something, or something, as I just did. Uh, then we all hear it along with her. <laughs> so apologize for that. Uh, Rob McMillan is a wine business expert. He is with Silicon Valley Bank, but uh, he's not. In the Silicon Valley, he is in the Napa Valley. That's where he's located. It is svb.com, and he is the go-to guy for many people in the wine business industry uh, for trends and those sorts of things. And he joins us on the line right now to talk about this predicted world wine shortage. Welcome to the program, Rob. Hey, thanks for that musical. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. No hey, problem. You know, as a musician, that's uh, that's always nice to hear. Oh, are you a musician too? <laughs> Yeah, I'm a rocker. Oh, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> right well, on. Maybe he could compose some of our bump music. That would be something fresh and new. Yeah, keep mm -hmm. him on the line. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so Rob, uh, what what were your thoughts when this when this uh, what would you call it a study a research piece came out regarding a world wine shortage? Uh, it was released by what's the name of the company? Uh, Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley. That's Morgan right. Stanley. <clears throat> so yeah. I imagine your phone must have started ringing off the hook. Yeah, you know, it's this, it's the second time I've seen one of those. There was one by City that was in, um, and both of these are out of Australia, by the way. Mm -hmm. One by City that was in uh, August, and that really didn't get any any play whatsoever. Uh, but this one by Morgan Stanley got picked up by uh, by CNN. Um, Aaron Smith in their money segment, yeah. and uh, and he he put out the report that there was going to be a worldwide shortage by I think it was something like 300 million cases, and um, yeah, my phone started ringing immediately. I bet, <laughs> I, I bet, bet. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, what is the what's the reasoning? Why do they say there will be a, such a shortage? Weather patterns? Um, they what they what they focus on are, and they, uh, by the way, they, they did a really good job. At, uh, this is Morgan Stanley out of Australia, a couple of analysts down there, did a really good job pulling together worldwide wine data. Mm -hmm. Trying to say that really fast. <laughs> worldwide <laughs> wine data. <Worldwide>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they did a really good job of that. Um, uh, but the way that they got to their conclusions is they made some estimates that were uh, entirely uh, faulty. Uh, wow. and and just to, to put in, in uh, to give you a big picture view of it, uh, they took consumption and they took production. They put them together. Obviously, you'd like to have as much wine made as you have consumed. That would be a balance. If you don't produce enough and you consume more, that would be a shortage. Although you know, it would be kind of hard to think about how you could consume more than is made, right? Right. Yeah, it's impossible. <laughs> right. <laughs> From a practical standpoint, but um, you know they they pointed out that there was going to be this huge uh, deficit. But the way they got there was they they took the trend line that was existing that went something. I'll just it's kind of hard to do on radio, but I'll I'll just talk you through it. It's like going ten each year, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, and then when they got to the year that they needed to estimate, they went two. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> and, then, and then they took that out and multiplied by five, and and that was the new trend line. Um, and then the, the uh, OIV, which is an organization out of France, came out with the um, with the number for 2013. And instead of being two, as the analysts predicted in Australia, it was more like eight. Oh, okay. So not only is not only is there no shortage, but there's actually a little bit of a surplus. Oh, okay. 
And I understand that our harvest this year in California is a bumper crop. It's supposed to be a great one. Does that match what you know? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, 2010 and 2011 were very short years in California, actually in the whole West Coast. And um, 2012, however, was in, in my years in the business, a, uh, a record year, both in yield and quality. Every wow. single appellation on the West Coast had fantastic harvest uh, conditions. And so now now we have 2013 virtually completed. There's still some, some grapes hanging out there that are, um, Late harvest. are little mm-hmm. stragglers, but mm-hmm. uh, we, know what, we know what we have pretty much, and we expect it to probably be the second largest harvest on record. Behind 2012. Behind 2012, right? Yeah. Wow. Anecdotally, that's what I'm hearing from winemakers. I've talked to quite a few. We had this big rock and harvest event here on the Central Coast, and they're really celebrating a great harvest this year, really, really happy with the results. So it's at least, you know, from what we're hearing, word of mouth. So And with the dry year, they might be a little stressed on top of it. I don't know, which might make for quality-wise, <laughs> might make it kind of good for those that dry farm, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, most of uh, most of the uh, the grapes that are out there aren't dry farmed anymore. They uh, and the irrigation drip irrigation is typically used um, not only just to keep the plants alive, but but to keep the temperatures down. So when when it really gets uh, over about ninety degrees, um, you start to worry about your grapes shriveling. It's more than stress; it just uh, it ruins them basically. Mm-hmm. So yeah. everybody pretty much likes to have drip irrigation. Then you, but you some... bring up a really good point, which is which is drought. And California is looking at uh, you know a second year of very dry conditions, uh, even even at this point. Yeah, we need a really wet winter to help out the water table for one thing, you know, and then also just to irrigate. Mm-hmm. But uh, right. <clears throat> now, Rob, you are so on top of these things. What are we looking at trend wise? People are drinking more wine, are they not? And the younger, the millennials are. There's a lot of emphasis yeah. put on the millennials. That's what we've heard. More wine drinkers in the U.S. and in China, apparently. Yeah, that's not true. That's not <laughs> true. <laughs> I love having Rob on the show because he can debunk all sorts that's of stuff. That's what we're hearing. So tell us what is true. <laughs> so um, production growth, uh, pardon me, um, uh, consumption growth is going up uh, between 2 and 3% a year. Um and uh, what we've seen over the last three or four years now is a decline in, in the growth of consumption. Mm. So it's not like we're having negative consumption where people are drinking less, but we went from growth of like, you know, 14% down to 8% down to 4 you know. So right. this year we forecast at the beginning of the year we would, we would have a growth rate in fine wine between 4 and 8%, and I think we're going to be at 4%. So the dollar component of that is uh, is not moving very much at all. It's still hard to press through price increases. The vintners, the, the wineries, are having a hard time getting the price increases that they would like to see. <clears throat> and then um, uh, on the millennial side, you're talking about the millennial consumers, they're coming into the market, but they're they're penniless at this stage. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they're uh, on the other side of the spectrum, the guys that have all the money, the boomers, they're all hitting retirement age at this point, and they're they're a heavier cohort. So while we have eleven thousand a day millennials that are coming on, we have fifteen thousand a day boomers that are retiring. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what about the China component? Um, the average Chinese uh, at the high end, at the high end of their uh, the spectrum, the guys that are you know in the in the upper side, they make uh, about fifteen thousand a year. Oh. So when you think about that, how many how many bottles of fine wine are they going to buy at twenty bucks a piece? And the answer is none. Right. So uh, uh, China, however, is has become the fifth largest producer of their own wine, of their own grapes. So they have a large push in to try to produce wines that are of a value that can be consumed in that country. So you know they, it's true that they are. A, a growing uh, consumer class, but wine is still as a, as a product largely uninteresting um, to them. They they are, if I'm remembering my stat right, they are something like 0.13 uh, gallons per capita versus um, you know where where we are in the U.S., which is I think about three and a half uh, gallons per capita per year. Three and a half so, gallons. So. <clears throat> I'm I'm helping 
way bad. <laughs> Randall's doing the part of a couple of people, I think. Maybe. Right. <laughs> hey, Rob, what is the what's the price point that people seem to be willing to pay for a nice or you know like a medium quality wine nowadays? What what's that magic number that uh, most wineries are finding success with? Well, there's success in every price point because everybody has got their own idea of um, of what value is. But the the part that's moving the best right now in terms of case sales and dollars combined would be between nine and fourteen dollars. Mm-hmm. Everybody is uh, everybody is uh, the big producers are trying to you know to find that. The oddity of that whole thing though is that you know if you if you say well gee I really want a special wine produced at fourteen dollars. Um, and the consumers flock to that spot. The, the big wine companies, of course, will find the wine to go ahead and, and make that product, but it'll, it'll change every single bottle, every single bottle run, because the wine comes from different vineyards, perhaps different countries. Right. Yeah. Mm, so I, there's not the consistency there. 9 to 14 sounds about right, especially if you look at the I Costco like price pointing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is where Patty and I buy a lot of our yes. <laughs> a lot of our wine. Yeah, love Costco. Yeah, you uh, know, there's a there is a really good uh, Kirkland uh, Napa Valley uh, blend that they that they put out. It's a, you know it's got Cabernet and and Merlot in it largely, and it's a it's a very nice blend. I've tried the the Merlot straight out of out of Kirkland. It's again a nice blend. They do a good job. It's excellent. I just had it uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Rob McMillan, wine business expert with Silicon Valley Bank, svb.com. Rob, thanks for joining us and dispelling the myths. You're welcome. Stick around, everyone. Just after the break, we return with some culinary classes that you can take throughout the state. Pie baking, cocktail mixing, and more. Straight ahead. The 2013 Harvest Festival Original Art and Craft Show is coming soon. From handmade earrings to hand-pressed olive oil, you'll find it at the 2013 Harvest Festival. With over 24,000 handmade American crafts, delicious food, and live entertainment, it's fun for the whole family. The original and the best. The Harvest Festival Art and Craft Show, Friday through Sunday, November 29th through December 1st at the San Jose Convention Center. Consider Eberly Winery this holiday season for your private event or special occasion, where the staff always ensures great wine, good times, and memories for a lifetime. The tasting room at Eberly is open daily from 10 to 5 with complimentary wine tasting, so you can find that perfect wine to pair with your holiday gatherings. And listen to this. Bring in a new unwrapped toy and receive 20% off all wine purchases. Don't forget about Eberly's complimentary tours of the world-famous wine caves, too. VIP tours and tastings are also available. Yeah. Join the Everly Tasting Room staff this season for the Holiday Open House. That's on Saturday, December the 14th from noon to 4. There will be carolers, appetizers, and Gary Eberly's famous free barbecue. Visit Eberly Winery today to start planning your holidays. Located in the heart of Paso Robles Wine Country on Highway 46 East, just off the 101. Visit EberlyWinery.com for more information. The 2013 Harvest Festival Original Art and Craft Show is coming soon. From handmade earrings to hand-pressed olive oil, you'll find it at the 2013 Harvest Festival. With over 24,000 handmade American crafts, delicious food, and live entertainment, it's fun for the whole family. The original and the best. The Harvest Festival Art and Craft Show. Friday through Sunday, November 29th through December 1st at the San Jose Convention Center.
And welcome back to the Eat, Drink, Explore Sunday Fun Day Show, everyone. I am your host, Randall White. Always great to have you with us. We are rounding out now the second and final hour of this week's program. So it's time for our weekly Explore California segment heard each week. And through December, it is our goal to give you some great ideas for enjoying yourself here in the Golden State or beyond. And with the holidays coming, some gift ideas that can be used and enjoyed, uh, experiences instead of actual items that you give people, knowledge and those sorts of things, plus big savings for you. We've teamed up with an organization that pulls together a huge range of activities, and teaming up with them also allows us to then give you 15% off anything you buy from that site uh, should you decide you want to explore some of these fun options. I'll tell you right away, right off the bat, and it's easy to remember, the promo code you use, three letters, that's it, E-D-E, for Eat, Drink, Explore. So E-D-E, that's all you have to type into the experiencedays.com website. That's the letter X instead of the instead of the word experience. It's the letter X experiencedays.com. So joining us on the line this week to find out uh, what is you know offered at a discounted price. Lots of fun here in the state is Michelle Geib. Uh, typically she joins us on the line from Colorado. Today she joins us on the line from Great Britain and <laughs> nice to have you on the program uh, across the pond, Michelle. Oh, let me Let nice me patch up. Here. There you are. <laughs> so, uh so today we're going to focus on learning how to cook. And let's start in San Francisco, which may be in terms of bread, the number one city in the nation. You've got your world-famous sourdough and lots of artisan bakeries uh, sprinkled around the Bay Area. Uh, and so they have a, a San Francisco bread-making workshop. We do. Um, and this is um, a great gift, either if you're looking to give someone the opportunity to learn a little bit more how to make it, or you want to try it for yourself and give someone... Um, the fruits of your labor, so to speak. In the Bay Area, we work with Sour Flower, which is a great bakery in the Mission District, and they offer three different classes that you can choose from. They're all two hours, and they have a sourdough starter workshop, uh, a dough development workshop, as well as my favorite, which is the bagel making workshop. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Yeah, at $80, you can't really go wrong with this one. No, and so... That would be because I've always wanted to bake my own bread. I'm I was telling you off air what a huge bread fan I am. Thank goodness I'm not gluten intolerant because I would just Exactly. I'd be up a creek. Uh I and I'm such a fan of sourdough. It would really be a pleasure for me to uh hand out some sourdough bread to people coming over for a dinner party and to be able to say for the first time in my life, I made that, you know? And so, uh, so, uh, sour flour in the mission, the mission has become a foodie hotspot. So it doesn't surprise me, uh, that it is located there. Okay. That is, uh, Class number one. Now let's head to a different part of San Francisco to learn out, learn how to make really high end cocktails. Yeah, this is another great one. Um, and it, also, whether you want to give someone the gift to learn how to mix drinks or you're throwing a party and need to get a few pointers yourself, um, we work with uh, San Francisco Mixology, and the classes are held at a lounge in Union Square, and they're on select Saturdays. These are also two-hour classes, and you get to learn a little bit more about how to set up a bar, when you shake, when you stir, and just how you go about mixing different uh, alcohols and what to add to them. So this would be a good class for somebody who not only likes to entertain and have people over the house and show off a little bit with your cocktail making abilities, but someone who might be interested in getting into the bartending industry. Exactly. It's a great step. Yeah. So the funny thing is you did not tell me that it was in the Mich- or in the uh, Union Square area. In my mind, I just automatically pictured it there because when I think of yep. cocktails, that's sort of where you'd be. So <laughs> yep, there you go. <laughs> Let's head south. Oh, go ahead. It's pre- is pretty uh, good price point. It's one hundred and twenty dollars and it's a lot of fun. I bet it's a lot of fun. You can't go. Uh, you can't have a night on the town in 
the in the Union Square area for 120 bucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's perfect. That's perfect. And there's just one class involved with this one. Exactly. Okay. So cocktail making in Union Square. We have a bread in the Mission District. Now we're going to head south, far south, to uh, Los Angeles to make pies. Now, I, w- I don't associate pies with Los Angeles, but there is an award-winning pie- baker there who will be teaching your lessons. There is. Her name is Penny Keaton, and she is a blue, uh, blue ribbon winner. She is a famous pie baker, and she her claim to fame is to teaching you how to bake a delicious flaky pie crust in the same amount of time that it takes to read the package on a frozen pie crust label. I like so, the sound of that because we're exactly. for this for this show, Michelle, we really try to get people away from processed and pre-made things. So this is perfect, right. especially with Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. Exactly. Everything's from scratch. She teaches you how to make healthy fillings as well. And the one of the fun parts about this particular activity is it takes place in your own Los Angeles kitchen. Oh, really? What if you don't live in L.A.? Well, you can go <laughs> anywhere in the county, but unfortunately it would need to be in L.A. County. I suppose you could, you know, they have some of those... Uh, I I can think of one Marriott Residence Inn. You could stay at a place where you get a kitchen, you know, as you could, yes. as part as of your room. As long as there's a place to cook. <laughs> Cuz that might be kind of fun, you know, make it a yeah. week make it a little weekend trip down to Los Angeles and then uh you know, stay at a place like a Residence Inn. I know they have other ones. That's the only one I can think of. But uh, a place and that has a kitchen. Bake a pie. <laughs> yeah, then you're messing up uh, someone else's kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> not your, <laughs> not your own. <laughs> All right. So uh, for the final one that we'll feature today, let's head back to the northern half of the state to everyone's favorite Napa Valley. And uh, the first hour of our program on Sundays is all about farmers markets. And so this is a trip to a farmers market in the Napa Valley, but it doesn't end there. It doesn't. You actually get to pick out some amazing fresh uh, local produce and uh, proteins. You get to go back to the chef's home and learn how to prepare a three course gourmet meal. Well, so you get so you you know you're using the freshest possible ingredients, and you exactly. know some people are a little bit d- not dumbfounded, but just there's such a variety. Overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, overwhelmed. That's a much better word when you get to a farmer's market. Uh, you're not sure what to do with it all, and in this case, you get top-notch culinary lessons with the fresh produce in Napa. It doesn't get, and there's wine served at this too. Exactly, it's a full day culinary adventure. Full day culinary adventure. Lots of great stuff as always. Michelle Guybe with experiencedays.com. The letter X. Experiencedays.com. We have a link at eatdrinkexplore.com. Do not, <clears throat> pardon me, forget the promo code E D E for some really big savings. You know, I think I put 30%. It's 15%, right? That's correct. Yeah, 15% savings. Sorry about that. On the video, it says 30. All right, Michelle, we'll talk to you later. You've been listening to the Eat, Drink, Explore radio program. If you missed any of our segments today, 